the 84th Psalm, please. Psalm number 84. And I want you to consider with me today what we will see here as the believer's journey. The believer's journey. Psalm 84. I would call your attention at some point when you have the uh, opportunity to read all 12 verses of Scripture. Uh, but this morning we're only going to concentrate on verses 5, 6, and 7. So we're in Psalm number 84. Let me ask you to stand with me please as we begin, begin reading from verse number 5. <coughs> Psalm 84. <coughs> The psalmist writes, Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. Father, we thank you for your precious word. Pray, God, now that uh, you will speak to our hearts, touch us, and move in our midst. We'll thank you and praise you for it all in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen. Thank you. You can be <coughs> So many times as I have said to you concerning other passages of Scripture, we have a tendency today in many of our churches to skip over or to gloss over or to simply ignore, uh, in many instances, the Old Testament. Thinking as though that's not any uh, longer important, uh, that uh, that time has passed by and that uh, it's of no uh, reason or accountability that we need to pay any attention to it. But as I've told you before, every word in the Word of God is here for a reason. Okay? None of it is here by accident. And what you also need to understand, what we need to grasp is everything in the Old Testament is a foreshadowing of something that is going to take place or something you need to be aware of over in the New Testament. Okay? So something over here is going to end up profiting you over there. So we need to remember that, and I want you to kind of keep an open mind this morning, even though we're going to be in the Old Testament. There are five things here in these three verses of Scripture that God's laid on my heart that I want to share with you concerning the believer's journey. So I would encourage you to take the back of that bulletin and, uh, and use that uh, to take your notes on this morning and to, uh, to write down these things because they're important. And they all start with the same letter, which will make it a little bit easier for you to grasp. The first thing I want to call your attention to here is the proclamation. The proclamation. You begin by looking at verse number 5. The first part of it says, Blessed. Or the old English, blessed is the man whose strength is in you. Capital Y-O-U, speaking of God. Blessed is the man whose strength is in God. I want you to understand that the word blessed there is the Hebrew word esher, E-S-H-E-R. Here it is used as a masculine plural uh, being used as an interjection here, which literally means in the Hebrew, many or multiple blessednesses. Okay? Not a one-time deal, not a singular thing, but many or multiple times is the blessedness or are the blessednesses of the man whose strength is in you. Here's the idea simply put. How incredibly blessed is the man or the woman, how incredibly blessed is the individual who comes to understand that their strength lies in God. Okay? You need to understand 
the fact that the Bible teaches us that our strength lies in Him, not in us. Okay? Our strength, our real strength, lies in our relationship to Him. And it doesn't really have anything to do with me or my individual strength. The New Testament describes the Christian life as a war. It talks about the fact that we are going to be in constant battles. We're going to be waging those wars and those battles against our adversary, the devil. Let me share with you for just a moment. In 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning with verse 6, here's what the Bible says. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Casting all your care upon Him, for He cares for you. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he might devour. Resist him. Steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. What is he saying there? Satan will be walking around and is walking around to and fro upon this earth, roaring like a lion, seeking whom he might devour. We need to understand that in and of ourselves, we are no match for our adversary. Do I need to say that again? In and of ourselves, we are no match for Satan. He seeks to devour. The Bible also tells us in James chapter 4, verse 7, Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now that's one of the most misinterpreted verses of Scripture in the entire Bible. Because many people say, well, you know, the Bible says that you just need to resist the devil and he'll flee from you. That's not what it says. Is it? That's not what it said. It said, first of all, submit yourselves unto God. <clears throat> then, because you have submitted yourselves unto Him, and going back to what we were just read and talked about in, in Psalm 84, because your strength is in Him, therefore you can resist the devil and he will flee from you. Not because of anything you've done. Not because of who you are but because of who He is and because of whose you are. You see, in your own strength, in your own ability, in your own wisdom, in your own cunning, you're no match for the wiles and the weapons and the wickedness of Satan. You remember what the Lord Jesus Christ said to Simon Peter over in Luke chapter 22? And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as Lord. Can you imagine that? <coughs> Jesus looks at Simon Peter and says, Satan has asked for you by name. And his, and his one purpose is that he might grind you up like wheat. Just absolutely carrying your life apart. My dear friend, when we are in and of ourselves, we are no match for the others. Okay? He's stronger than you are. He's more wicked than you are. He's more cunning than you are. He can whip you with both hands tied behind his back. Okay? Because that's how much of a difference there is between him and you. You've got to understand. Remember who Satan was before he fell? He was Lucifer, son of the morning. He was the highest created being that was ever created by God. Okay? The highest of God's created beings was Lucifer, who now has become Satan, our adversary. So you and I are no match for Him clothed in our own strength. But when you are clothed 
in the strength of Almighty God, Satan is no match for you. When you are clothed not in you, but in Him, when you realize that your strength comes from God above and not from you beneath, while you are no match for Him, He's no match for God. <laughs> He's no match for God. He went up against God. Go back and read Isaiah chapter 14. He went up against God. He decided, He determined, I'm going to take the place of God. I'm going to put my throne higher than His. I will take His place. And what does the Bible say? God cast Him out of heaven with a third of the angels. Just flung Him out. The Bible says one day he's going to be placed in a bottomless pit. He's going to spend a thousand years there. And then ultimately he'll be cast in the lake of fire and brimstone. That the Bible says has been created specifically for the devil and his angels, his followers, his demons. So we're no match for him. Bless his holy name. Satan is no match for God. Amen. So we have the proclamation in Psalm 84 verse 5. How incredibly blessed is the man whose strength is in God. Which leads me to point number two. You've got the proclamation. Secondly, you've got the passage. The passage. The first part of verse 5 says... Blessed is the man whose strength is in you. The second part of verse 5 says, Whose heart is set on pilgrimage. Whose heart is set on pilgrimage. My dear friend, countless times in the Word of God, the child of God is described as being on a trip, as being on a journey, as going from point A to point B to point C, and so on and so forth. The Bible teaches that we are passing through this world. That we are moving, always moving toward our eternal home. I don't know whether you understand this or not, but you need to get a grasp of the fact that this is not home. Amen. This is not home. We're just passing through down here. First Chronicles chapter 25, excuse me, chapter 29, verse 15 says this, for we are aliens and pilgrims before you, as were all our fathers, and our days on earth are as a shadow. That's the Old Testament. New Testament, Hebrews 11, 13 says, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them from afar off and were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims upon the earth. Strangers and pilgrims. Aliens and pilgrims. Think with me a minute. Hebrews 11.10 describes a city whose builder and maker is God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 1 talks about a building from God, a house that has not been made by hands that is eternal in the heavens. James 4.4 4 asks the question, well, what is your life? It is but a vapor that appears for a little while or for a little time, for a short period, and then vanishes away. You know how vapor does that. You take a, a tea kettle a, a, and put it on the, the, the burner on the oven or on the stove, and once it gets hot enough, the steam comes out the spout. If it's a whistling kettle, you can hear the whistle. And it's, and it's putting out that steam. But what happens? Immediately when you pick it up and put it off of the burner, the whistling stops and the steam stops. Because the source that produced the steam is no longer connected with the pot of water. Okay? So our lives 
are but a vapor. We're here and gone. I really had that brought back to me. Not that I'd ever really forgotten it. But Thursday night a week ago, when we went to Harris Funeral Hall, uh, Debbie and I didn't get there in time to, uh, no, I'm sorry, I said Thursday, Sunday night, when, uh, when uh, we were to view the, uh, the body of my dad, uh, the family was able to go in at 3 o'clock, but, you know, we were here and then we had to drive up there, so we didn't get there at 3 o'clock. So the first time I saw him was about 5.30, and the uh, public was invited to come in about 6 o'clock. So I had prayed, and I had asked God, you know, to, to help me during that time. Uh, and when we got there, uh, it was basically Debbie and me and Tara, uh, her children, and Josh and uh, Andre and their children, and Jared and Laura. And, uh, and we all got there about the same time, and we went in, and that was the first time that I had the opportunity to, to see my dad's body since the uh, funeral home had prepared it. And I walked in, and I'll never forget it, I walked in, and I looked down at that box, <coughs> and I realized, I, I mean, I had this in my mind, but it's like God brought all of this back to me again. And I'm so thankful that He did. I looked down, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, that's not Dad. That's not Dad. That was His earthly tent. You know? That was His temporary housing. <coughs> Your dad's gone. You know? Not only is your dad gone, your dad's with me. He's not here. That's not him. And so, it's been several times since he passed on that Friday a week ago. I driving down the road the other day. I was at the football game Thursday night getting ready to to do the announcing for the football game and I was walking up getting ready to go into the press box and I looked up toward the sky and I said hey dad how's it going bet you have a great time aren't you that's where dad is he's not in that body he's not in that casket he's not six feet under he's going home to be with Jesus why? because our life is but a vapor it's here and it's gone. See, my dear friend, what you and I need to remember at all times is this world is not our home. We're only passing through. <coughs> our time here, forever how long or short that period may be, will be like a drop of water in the sea of eternity compared to what it will be when we come to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. But there are some who may be in here this morning. There may be some who are watching via YouTube that I need to speak to this morning because there may be some of you here who are putting way too much time. Hear me carefully. You're putting way too much time on the here and now and not nearly enough time on the hero. Amen. Amen. Yeah. My dad lived 86 and a half years. <coughs> okay. My dad lived 86 and a half years. And that's a good long life on planet Earth. But you know what? On September the 19th, my dad really just started living. That's right. Okay? Because 10,000 years from now, he'll still be in the presence of Jesus. And I thought about Dad being up there. There, there are times we used to go to the beach and, uh, and Dad would get out in the, the water uh, and, and, and we kids would, would get out there. Patricia and I would get out, you know, we were little shavers. And, so Dad would get out there in the water and, and would have us come out there to where he was. But... Uh, I always remember when he first would get in the water, 
you know, it's, it's, it's hot here and the water, even though it might be the middle of uh, July or August, the water is always colder than the, than the land is. And Dad would always get in and you'd see him when the, when the wave would come up the first time, he'd go, <laughs> you know, always. <clears throat> and I can just imagine the other day when he stepped into the presence of God. For 10,000 years, he's going to stand there going, <laughs> because it's just overwhelming. It's overwhelming. <clears throat> so hear me. Please, whether you're sitting here or you're watching there, please hear me when I tell you <coughs> don't plant your roots too deep into this earthly soil. Don't hammer your tent stakes in too far. We need to learn how to travel lightly. We need to learn how to hold on to the things of this world loosely. Some of us have a white knuckle grip on this life and the things of this life. <laughs> but not, my dear friend, listen. This, this, this <coughs> isn't the destination. This isn't home. This, this isn't where God intends for you to settle down. We're on a pilgrimage. We're passing through this life. We're passing through this world. Okay? This is a temporary. This is like a rest stop. You're on a, a long travel somewhere and you pull off into one of those rest areas. This is kind of a, a rest area. And it might be a 50 year or a 65 year or an 85 year or a 110 year rest area. But it's simply a rest stop. It's not whole. It's not the ultimate goal. <coughs> that brings me to the third point. Which is the procedure. The procedure. First part of verse 6 says, as they pass through the valley of Baca. As they pass through the valley of Baca. Two important things that I want you to, to catch about this thing of being on pilgrimage. If you look at verse 6, you'll notice the word they. As they pass through. Notice it doesn't say he, it doesn't say she, it doesn't say you, it doesn't say I. It uses the word they, which is what? Collective. It's a plural, correct? When we talk about us or we talk about them or we talk about they, we're talking about more than one person, right? Nod your head like this. Thank you. Okay. Just want to make sure you're with me. So the word here is they. But if you go back, we don't have the time, but if you go back and you look at verses 1, 2, 3, and 4, you're going to find these phrases. My soul, my heart, my flesh, my king, and my God. Now all of those are what? Singular. Talking about an individual. And then you'll notice at the end of verse 4 the transition that goes from my king and my God to they will still be praising you. And then beginning here in verse number 6 and going on into verse number 7, we find the phrases, they pass through. They make it a spring. <coughs> they go from strength to strength. So, why the change? Why do we go from my, 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 my to they, they, they? Get this, it's very important. Verse 1 through the first part of verse 4 deals with your intimate relationship with Almighty God. Okay? Verse 1, 2, 3, and the first part of verse 4 deal with your intimate, personal relationship and fellowship with God. You see, your relationship and your fellowship with God is your business and your responsibility. But picking up with the second part of verse 4 and going through 5, 6, and 7, 
That doesn't deal with relationship. That deals with pilgrimage. And pilgrimage is a shared journey with shared responsibilities. In other words, intimacy with God is a me matter. Pilgrimage is a they matter. The intimacy is mine and mine alone. You see, I might have an intimate, close, personal, dynamic relationship and fellowship with God, but you can't ride on the coattails of mine. Okay? You can't say, my pastor is close to God, therefore I am too. Doesn't work that way. I can't ride on Debbie's. You can't ride on mine. We can't ride on one another's. Intimacy of fellowship and relationship with God is a personal matter. It is a me matter. Intimacy is mine and mine alone. But pilgrimage, listen, pilgrimage is to be done together. Together. Why? The truth is, we do it together in order to remind you and to remind me that we are not alone on this journey called life. You need to get that. Pilgrimage is a shared thing. It's a faith thing. So that you and I do not ever forget that we are not alone in this journey. While we're passing through, we're not passing through alone. We have brothers and sisters who likewise are going along the same path in the same journey. Pilgrimage is a together thing. Done in tandem with other believers. It's been developed and given to us by Almighty God as a protection device to protect us from self and Satan. It's designed in order that it might keep you and I out of depression and loneliness and melancholy and pity parties when we begin to think things like life is unfair. God is unfair. Nobody cares. Nobody knows what I'm going through. In Galatians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul says, Brethren, if any man be overtaken in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. And in James chapter 5, verse 16, we find these words, Confess your trespasses to one another, and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man available. <coughs> it's a shared thing. It's a shared thing. Listen, it's a situation of where there are going to be times when I'm going to be, listen, when I'm going to be up and you're going to be down. And it's my responsibility when you're down to help lift you up. There's going to be other times when you're going to be up and I'm going to be down. And it's your responsibility to lift me up. Man. You see, we're in it together. Friend, that's why it's so <coughs> dynamically important that especially on the Lord's Day that you and I don't opt out to go somewhere else. We need to be here because you and I need Him, but we need one another. Amen. 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 We need one another. I can't speak for any other preacher. I can't speak for any other pastor. But I'll just be flat out honest with you. I don't enjoy preaching to empty pews. Never have. If I enjoyed that, I could come out here on Thursday afternoon and have a great morning time. <laughs> Amen. And back uh, years ago when I was young in the ministry, I'd come out and I'd practice my, my sermon, you know. Thursday, Friday afternoon, or whatever. I mean, I really get into it. Never got an amen. No one. Never got anybody to you know to, to walk to you know the altar. No, nobody ever came to the front. Nothing. It was as though I was there by myself. Oh, I was. 
We need one another. Okay? We need... I Look, I understand. I understand vacation. You take yours. I take mine. You deserve yours. Debbie deserves hers. I just go along for the ride. But, <laughs> but, but, we, but we, all, we all deserve it. And I don't have a problem with you going. But friend, we need one another. I need you and you need me and, and we need them and they need us and we need to, we need to uplift one another because, listen, nobody in here, I don't care what anybody said, nobody in here is up seven days a week, 365 days out of the year. You're just not. It's just human nature. It isn't going to happen. So we need one another. We need to understand that we're not alone. God in His infinite wisdom has placed us on this pilgrimage together. That you and I might love one another, that we might pray for one another, that we might uplift and uphold one another, and if necessary, we might even have to rebuke one another so that nobody feels alienated and alone and so that no person gets left behind. Now, that was the first thing that I wanted you to see about pilgrims. The second thing is notice the phrase in verse 5, pass through. Pass through. It's the same idea. It gives the same idea as the word pilgrimage. It denotes a movement or a motion. It's a word that pictures an action as opposed to an inaction. It's somebody doing something, not somebody sitting somewhere and watching everybody else do something. I always, uh, I always remember when we were kids going to the beach, and if you were familiar with the Myrtle Beach, you'll remember the gay dolphin down on the boardwalk. Okay? <coughs> As kids, uh, Patricia and I and Mama, we, we'd go into these places and go, you know, we'd go on the gay dolphin and shop and everything else. Dad never would go in. Dad always got him a seat out there uh, on one of the benches outside the gay dolphin. And one time when I asked him, <laughs> one time when I asked him, why, why are you doing that? He said, because. He said, you can sit here for 30 minutes. And he said, and the entire world will pass you in a 30-minute span of time. He said, I can see it all. There was movement. There's motion. There's activity. Dad was sitting, but the world was passing by right before his eyes. That's the idea here in the word pass through. It is an active word. Think of it. Think of it if you will. The, the, just get the, 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 the picture in your mind of, a, of, of get, going up to a drive through window in a fast food restaurant. Okay? As opposed to parking the car and getting out and going in and ordering and dining in the person pulls into the line, puts the order through the, uh, the speaker, pulls up, pays their money, pulls on up to the second window, hopefully gets what they ordered. Uh, just courting, and we won't go. That's a sermon for a different day. But, uh, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, but pulls up and, and pays, and then pulls up the next one and gets what they want, and then they, they move on down the road. Whether it's eating and going somewhere else or taking it home to eat, whatever the case is, what I'm getting at is the time in the drive through is quicker than parking and going in and sitting down and having the meal. You spend less time in the drive through You're able to get what it is that you ordered, get what it is that you needed, and then continue the trip after a brief and temporary stop at the window. 
that's the idea here about passing on or passing through. Now, I'll finish that thought in just a moment, but let me call your attention to point number four, which is the place. The place, and the place is in verse six, the valley of Baca. The valley of Baca. I've already told you, the journey is a process. It is continual movement, an ongoing journey made up of mountains and valleys, of fertile plains and desert regions. Sometimes we find ourselves up, and sometimes we find ourselves down. Sometimes we find ourselves in prosperity, sometimes we may find ourselves in poverty. There will be times of delight. There will be times of discouragement. And a lot of people would rather not have <coughs> mountaintops and valleys. They'd rather just have mountaintops. There's a lot of people that if they were the meteorologists, we would never have rain. It'd always be blue sky. Because they like the sunshine. If everybody was like one person that's in this room today, it'd always be summertime. Wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we were here Wednesday night. It was a little bit cool and overcast. It was raining just a little bit. Jan had her jacket on. I said, Woman, what in the world have you got that jacket on? She said, I'm waiting for summer. <laughs> and I thought, that's been fall for like two or three days. <laughs> And she's already waiting for some. But my point is, if you only had mountaintops, you'd get to the point to where you'd no longer appreciate the mountaintop. You see, it's the violence that you go through that make you appreciate the mountaintop. And if you'd never had any rain, if it was always sunny and pleasant, if it was always sunny and 75 degrees, guess what? <coughs> you'd end up having a desert sooner or later. If you never had it, it's the rain that makes you appreciate the sunshine. It's the rain, along with the sunshine, that allows things to grow, right? If you had all the one and none of the other, regardless of which way it went, you wouldn't have anything. You'd either have a desert or you'd have a flood. But God in His infinite wisdom gives both in order that we might be able to grow. He not only does that in the world out there, follow me, He does that in the world in here. Okay? There are going to be days well, you're going to be up on top of the mountain. There are going to be days when if you didn't know any better, you'd think the mountain was going to be on top of you. There are going to be days when you're going to look out and man, the birds are chirping and the grass is growing and the breeze is blowing and it's sunny and it's 75 degrees and it's like, wow. Then there's going to be other days of thundering and lightning pouring down rain. The umbrella turns inside out and gets soaked. And you come home and you're just a mess. But if it weren't for those kinds of days, you wouldn't appreciate the sunny and 75 degree day. Not only does that happen out there, God allows it to happen in here. What I want you to understand is this thing of the Valley of Baca, this is not... Uh, a play on words. This was an actual valley in Israel. Okay? And what you needed to understand is that in those days it was it was close, it was north but close to Jerusalem. And the people who lived north of Jerusalem, in order to come to the festival and feast days, they would have to travel through the valley of Baca to get to Jerusalem. You had to go that way. There was no other way to go. 
You either went, listen, you either went to Rubaka or you didn't go at all. There wasn't a I-485 that went around Baca. You had to go through the plane. It was a dry, arid, tough place to go and to cross through. The word Baca literally means the valley of tears, the valley of weeping, the valley of crying. It was a hot, dusty, difficult, dry piece of ground that had, listen, that had to be crossed in order to get to the holy place. Did you hear me? It had to be, it was a difficult place, but it had to be crossed to be able to get to the holy city. You see, it was called the valley of weeping or the valley of tears because people literally would cry out in distress. Cry out because of the desert and the difficulty and the distress that they were in. It literally became a valley of tears, of mourning, of anguish, of grief. And listen, they couldn't go around it. They had to go through it. see the Christian pilgrimage <coughs> is going to take you through your valley of Baca from time to time. Are you listening to me? There are going to be days of distress. There are going to be days of difficulty. There will be days of tears. There are going to be days that you're going to be just like David. Who said in Psalm 23, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You're going to feel that way. You're going to grieve and mourn and weep and, and have difficulty. But hear me carefully. God never promised us an easy journey. You won't find that anywhere in the Word of God. He never said that the journey would be without difficulty. But He did promise us that one of these days, when we get home, when we come into His presence, we'll be able to look around, in front, in back, on the side, on the side, and we'll be able, in taking all of that in, when we're finally in His presence, to be able to look back and say, it was worth the trip. It was worth it all. My dad struggled and my dad suffered for the last six months of his life. Not like some of your uh, loved ones have because some of you have had people that have struggled and, and suffered for years. And I know that. But I saw my dad get to the point to where he couldn't take care of himself. He could not walk. He did not want to eat and all those kind of things. And I, and I realized the struggle that he was going through and all of that kind of thing. But the moment when he stepped from this life into the presence of God, it was like, it's worth it all. It's worth it all. The Bible tells us in Romans 8, verse 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. The New Living Translation says it this way. I love this. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory He will reveal to us later. Isn't that great? What we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory that He will reveal to us later. In other words, listen, listen, I don't care what you're going through, I don't care where you've been, I don't care how difficult the situation may be, one of these days, if you're a child of God and you step into His presence, when you step into His presence, He's going to blow you away. Amen. You know? 
you might need to take several pairs of socks because he's going to blow them off. <laughs> Maybe instead of that uh, tobacco and spit cup, when we buried dead that day, maybe we need to put four or five pairs of socks on there. I didn't think about that until <laughs> just now. Maybe your dad had an extra pair that he didn't even loan my dad. Hopefully that's dead. So, knowing that while our pilgrimage we pass through the valley of tears from time to time, the important thing becomes this, not will we go through it? We've already determined that we will. The important thing is, how will you respond to Baca? When you're faced with that situation in your life, when you're going through your valley of tears, when you're going through your place of mourning or your place of weeping, how are you going to respond? You see, the most important thing is how we will act and what we will do when we pass through our way of weeping. You see, weeping is a sign of brokenness. Tears are a sign of brokenness. And for adults, for adults, 95% of the time when we shed tears, okay, for adults, 95% of the time when we shed tears, we shed them because we are broken. Namely, we are heart broken. Maybe it was a relationship that didn't go the distance. Maybe it was a child that got hurt or a child that was sick. Maybe we lost our job. Maybe our finances have gone up in smoke. Maybe we've lost a loved one through death. You get the picture. Whatever it is, it causes us to be broken and most especially heartbroken. But the question remains, what will you do and how will you react when you and I go through the valley of tears? How are we going to live? What are we going to say? What kind of legacy are we going to leave? Will people, will people look at our lives and realize that we're just all talk? Or will they realize that when push comes to shove, that which we said we believe, that which we said that we would do, we actually are doing it? Is it going to be the fact that when, when we have to go through our valley of Baca, that we're going to stand tall or we're going to come unraveled like a cheap suit to where people look at us and say, well, they made it sound good, but when it happened to them, We can, we, can, we can respond one of two ways. We can be like, you remember when Job lost everything he had? Remember what Job's wife did? Or what Job's wife said? Why don't you just curse God and die? Now that's one way we can handle it. Just raise our fist and curse Him and just die. Do you remember what Job said? He said, sweetheart, you talk like a foolish woman. And the Bible says that Job fell down upon his knees and he <clears throat> worshipped God. He worshipped God. You see, your valley of tears is going to lead you through one of two paths. There's the, past, there's the path to blessedness which will ultimately lead to bountifulness or there's the path to bitterness that will ultimately lead to barrenness. You'll either be bountiful or barren. And it's your choice. It's your choice. When we come to our Valley of Baca, the choice is not only ours, but we've got to understand that it's going to either make us bitter or better. <laughs> okay? Either bitter or better. Now let me bring this to a, to a close. You're going to go through Baca. I'm going to go through Some of you have already gone through parts of it. 
some of you have still got parts of it to go. But hear me carefully as I bring this to a conclusion. God intends for Baca to be a place of teaching, <coughs> not a place of torture. Baca is to be a place of restoration, not of ruin. God intends for Baca to be a place where He stretches you, not where you cocoon yourself up into self-pity. But whatever Baca is, listen, it is a temporary place. The pilgrimage is destined to pass through this valley of tears. I didn't come up with the phrase. I wish I had, but I'll share it with you anyway. When things come up like that in your life and you're a child of God, just remember, they didn't come to stay. They came to pass. They came to pass. God's brought you to that place. He brought you there to swim, not to sink. He brought you there to fly, not to fail. He brought you there to conquer, not to concede. Listen, God takes us at times into the deep waters of life. Sometimes we may resist because we don't want to go into the deep end of the pool. We'd rather stay over here where it's about knee deep. You know, it's, it's not it's not dangerous over there where it's knee deep. But if you get over there where it's twelve or fifteen or eighteen or twenty feet deep. It could potentially get dangerous. Listen, when God takes us into the deep, He doesn't take you there for you to go under. He takes you there in order to show you how you might through Him be able to go over. To go over. Which brings me to the last point. There is the promise. The promise. The last part of verse 6 and verse 7 says they make it a spring. The rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. The promise is that that dry, arid, desert region of Baca will become a spring. It will become a fountain. And the rains will cover it with pools of water. Now the interesting thing there is the word pools in the Hebrew is the word for blessings. Remember what we read at the very beginning? Blessed is the man whose strength is in you. And now when, when the psalmist talks about it covers the area of Baca with pools, the word <coughs> is blessings. You see the picture? Let me share this as we close. When you and I are obedient to God, when we are pliable, when we are moldable, when we are teachable to Him, <coughs> our valley of tears turns into a place of blessings. The precious rain of God's love and mercy and grace and blessing will fall upon those who are obedient in Baca. The word promises that God will send His blessings like rain that gathers in pools all the ground so that we might grow in Him and gain more and more strength in the journey and for the journey until that blessed day when we stand in the Lord's presence and we hear him say, Well done. Welcome home, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. What I'm concerned about is, talk about passing through. What I'm concerned about is, for some people, a problem, a setback, a calamity, some sort of <coughs> devastation has caused them to give up and to quit. They're in Baca, but they're not <coughs> passing through. Something has happened and it, it has caused them to sit down and to stop.
God didn't lead you to Baca for you to quit. God didn't lead you to Baca for you to stop. Listen, I'm through. When God takes you to Baca, He does so that He might be able to teach you some things about Himself and about yourself that you will not learn in any other way nor in any other place. Amen. He'll teach you things there that you won't learn anywhere else. So there is a reason, there is a purpose for Him taking you there. But remember, it didn't say that you go there to stay there. It says you go there to pass through there. Why? Because God has other things. Other things that He wants to do in your life. Let's pray. <coughs> Thank you, Father, for this time of being able to share this powerful passage of Scripture. Pray, God, that it has gripped the hearts and lives and minds and spirits of every single one of us who are here today. And I pray, dear God, that if there are any of my brothers or sisters who are here today who find themselves maybe even <coughs> at this moment either passing through Baca and we need to pray for them and encourage them. Or they have passed through and because of the severity, because of the calamity, because of the, the degree of difficulty they quit. They feel like that you took them to Baca to kill them or to keep them there which that was never your purpose and never has been your purpose for any of your children. So God, help us to come clean with you today and to rejoice even in the midst of our suffering, even in the midst of our pain, even in the midst of our grief, even in the midst of our loss, knowing that you are in control and you do not make any mistakes. And we can trust you with our everything. So have your way. And we'll be careful to praise you for it all. For it's in your blessing, the holy name that we ask. You. Amen. 294 is our hymn, and that's what we're going to sing about. Have thine own way, Lord. You are the potter, I am the clay. I yield to you and ask you to have your way in my life. This altar is open. If I can help you pray about something, I'd be glad to do so. But let's let's allow God to have his way in our heart. 294 is standing